Welcome back, everyone. Today, it's Isaiah 53, which is probably the best passage in the Bible, or one of the best passages in the Bible, that deal with penal substitution. So if you've been watching these videos, I'm going through a whole playlist here on penal substitution, the penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Uh, did it really happen? And the answer is yes. And we're actually looking right now at rebuttal to it. And one of the rebuttals is that it's not in the Bible, that it was come up with, uh, that the reformers came up with it, uh, John Calvin and all them. But I think if we go all the way past them and go all the way back and find in the Bible, then obviously they didn't come up with it. And it's real, regardless of what anybody thought through all those years. And so in the last video, we actually looked at many Bible passages where it does show up in the Bible. Today, I want to focus on Isaiah 53 and then also move to another passage really quickly at the end that talks about it. But Isaiah 53 uh, talks about the suffering, uh, what we call the suffering servant. And uh, the question that we actually have here, who is the suffering servant? Now, this was kind of interesting because I actually shot this video yesterday, and then I realized I had some sound issues. The sound wasn't very good, so I'm going to reshoot it today. Uh, but last night, after I had shot that video, we actually had a Jewish missionary in here at the church sharing about his ministry, and I asked him about Isaiah 53 because I've heard that many times Jews were not allowed to actually read this, and obviously the answer was, I mean, that's it depends. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't, but he kind of gave an interesting history about how uh, some people began to think that this was actually in re reference to Israel as a nation. That's some people think, well, it's not about the Messiah, it's not about Jesus, it's about um, it's about the nation of Israel. He gave a history, and it'd be interesting to study more about that. But he says in Hebrew, it's very clearly about a person. So this is about Jesus. But what I want to do before we actually get into Isaiah 53, which you may or may not be real familiar with the passage, uh, it is probably one of the most well-known passages, I think, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. I want to look at some uh, places in the Bible where they quote from it, and in the New Testament, they quote from Isaiah 53 in reference to Jesus. So I'm just going to show you a few of them here, uh, and then we'll actually look in Isaiah 53. But the first one is Matthew 8, 16 to 17. It says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So that is a quote from Isaiah 53 in reference to Jesus. The next one we'll look at is Luke uh, 22, starting in verse 35, verses 35 to 37. And he said to them, when I send you without, uh, when I sent you without money, bag, knapsack, and sandal, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has a sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you, that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. Here he quotes from Isaiah 53, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end, or they have a purpose. That's what he's saying here. So it's a quote from Jesus uh, about Isaiah 53, applying it to himself. The next one is John chapter 12 and verse 37 to 41. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has uh, believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, and lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. So there's more quotations uh, from Isaiah 53 in reference to Jesus. And then just one more for now. This is Acts 8, 30. Um, it says, uh, so, so this is a situation with Philip and the eunuch. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who will declare his generation? Uh, for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. And then he, of course, he went down 
and he got baptized. Let me get the whole thing for you. So uh, these are all quotations from Isaiah 53, and they're showing that, yeah, this is about Jesus. So let's actually go to Isaiah now. But before we get to 53, we have to get to, um, to Isaiah 52. I, I said it, and then I didn't do it. Isaiah, because the context starts in Isaiah 52, and you always, of course, have to look at the context before you look at anything. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13 is where it begins. Let's scroll down to verse 13. Behold, my servant, and this is talking about Jesus, per the New Testament authors and Jesus himself. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man. I mean, this is talking about a man and his form more than the sons of man. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Now, this is really interesting because it's talking about the servant of God who is going to come and do all this. And we know as the Messiah, we know as Jesus. But that word sprinkle there, uh, where it says he's, he will sprinkle many nations, that's interesting. Oh, goodness, it's going to... Uh, there we go. Get it back on the Bible. Uh, the word sprinkle there is the same words that's used as far as the kaporeth in the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with that, you need to look at my other videos on the atonement. The kaporeth was the, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant, the place where the atonement happened, and the, the priest would sprinkle blood on that. And so it says here, look, you know, my servant is going to sprinkle many nations. The idea is that uh, this blood of the atonement will be applied for many nations. This is a an early gospel uh, description that it goes out to the Gentiles and not just to the Israelites. And so it's, it's just very early there. Hey, he's going to sprinkle many nations. He's going to atone for many nations. Uh, kings shall shut their mouth at him. For what they for what had not been told, they shall see, and what they had not heard, they shall consider. So now we get into the famed Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. So when the Bible uses the word arm, the arm refers to power. Who, to whom is the power of God been revealed? Then it goes on to describe, for he, that's Jesus, the servant here, he shall grow before him, God, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no former comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The idea here is not like he was born in the great palace. It's not like he, you know, that he had... Um, just this huge thing. Wow, look, the Messiah, the King is born, and we've been waiting for him, and it's a big thing. No, he was born in a place where animals lived, whether it was in a stable or in a, the bottom part of a house. It's, it, it was where animals lived, put, put in a manger, a feeding trough. The shepherds are the ones who got the announcement, the shepherds that nobody really liked. They just kind of out on the hillside. And so it's not like people are going to come and say, wow, look at Jesus, man. There's something about this guy. He goes around with this, with this touch by an angel glow on his head. You know, he got all that. It's just not the way that it was. He was like just a tender plant, like a root out of dry ground. And there's nothing that people would see and say like, wow, this here has got to be the Messiah just by looking at him. Verse three, he is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He's a man of sorrows. I mean, you think about when you have to go to the doctor or the dentist or something and you dread it for a while, right? You're like, I don't want to do this. This is not fun. Can you imagine being Jesus and knowing what was going to happen in your life? Knowing that you're going to take all the sins of man on you and you're going to die and, and be tortured and, in a way that you did not deserve at all. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be like that? That is... Um, that would cause you to be a man of sorrows, and that's exactly what he was. He's acquainted with grief. He understood grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. So we hid our faces from him uh, when he was doing this for us, and we didn't even esteem him. When I think of that word esteem, it's kind of like when you go to a funeral and you walk by the casket and you esteem that person. Or or when we stand up there and we talk about the person, you know, oh, he was a great man. He was a great father. He worked for a company for 50 years and he was a great employee. Uh, and he did all these things for his community. We're esteeming that person. We're lifting them up. And the idea of Isaiah is you're not even doing that for Jesus. It's like, oh, oh, look, he died. He died to the criminals. Oh, big deal, right? That's, that's what he's getting at here. Then he goes to verse four. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, I want you to pay attention to the pronouns here because this is where we really get into penal substitution. We are the ones who deserve this, but he is the one who, um, who experienced it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him 
uh, smitten my, uh, stricken, smitten my God, and afflicted. So it's this is penal substitution. We deserve that penalty. We deserve that punishment. He is the one who took it. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was on him. By his stripes, we are healed. So you say, look at, look at all these pronouns here. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. He's one who took the stripes, and we are the ones who get healed. So this is a penalty, the penal part, and this is a substitution where he did it for us by his stripes we are healed. What hurt him healed us. Some people refer to this as cosmic child abuse, which is one of the things, the rebuttals that we're going to look at later, uh, where God is just so mad, he's angry, and, and he takes us out on, on his son, and he's just like this massive cosmic child abuse going on. Well, that's the Bible paints a very different picture of that because we start to see here in verse 7, he did it willingly. Verse 7 says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. It's the idea of a lamb knowing exactly what he's going through, uh, through when he gets in the line and he goes up and he and he gets in line to be, um, you know, to, to go through the shearing. And that's the idea. Jesus went to the cross and he did this willingly. It's not like anyone had to drag him. It's not like he had his disciples fight to keep it from happening. He did it willingly. I'm going to tell you, when I was a kid, I would not take a whipping for anything my brother did. Not, not on purpose anyway. But Jesus did that for everybody. He took all that sin, the wrath of God, he took it on him when we are the ones who deserved it. That is nothing short of penal substitution. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? The idea is, you know, he, he, who declares generation? What generation does he have? He doesn't have any kids. He died, you know, childless. And so who's going to declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. It was other people's transgression that caused him to be stricken. You see how that works. Penal substitution. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. So that's a prophecy right there. He made his grave with the wicked. He died with criminals. He died as a criminal should have died. It wasn't like this, there was this great martyrdom where, you know, everyone was standing around saying, well, this is the Messiah and some people don't like him. But he, he died with the wicked people, but then with the rich in his death. Of course, that's a reference to Je uh, Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man who put Jesus in his borrowed tomb for just for a few days. Uh, and so he died with wicked people, and he was buried with rich people because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. There was, there was nothing that he had done that was wrong. He had not had any deceit. He hadn't done anything to deserve this, but he did it for other people. The cross uh, was a, uh, a very humiliating Roman method of uh, punishment. Uh, and not only that, but he had criminals on his side. So it's not like this was some glorious thing everyone would look at at it. They're saying, here's a criminal who died, and he did it for other people, not because of himself, not because he was a criminal. Then we get to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, the Father, has put him, Jesus, to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Well, he doesn't have any seed, he doesn't have any children. No, but he has spiritual children. That's all of us who come along afterwards. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. He's going to come back to life. Prophecy. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It says there, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? You know, I mean, why, why would it please God to bruise his father or to bruise his son to see this happening? And the answer is that God in his holy nature requires a punishment for sin. And this is the punishment. Death and bloodshed is the punishment for sin. And Jesus took it. It's not like God enjoyed watching his son die, but he enjoyed the process of uh, bringing many people to him. That was the ultimate goal, and that's what he wanted. Jesus was willing in this too. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn in two, and now anyone can access the Holy of Holies uh, because Jesus is the final mediator. You don't need the priest to do that anymore. That is what God wanted. That is why it pleased God. Just like all the, the sacrifices, Yom Kippur and all the other ones, uh, why they would please God. Not like he loved to see an animal die, but he loves man to be reconciled with him. And the only way to do that is death. And Jesus took that death 
for other people. That's why it pleased God to bruise the son. Let's read verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. God was satisfied with what Jesus did. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. When you come to know who Jesus is and you believe in him, you will then be justified, legally declared as righteous, even though you actually have sin. That's what justified means. We hear the phrase sometimes, it means just as if I'd never sinned, which is, it's okay just if you want to get the idea across, but it's not just as if you never sinned, because if you never sinned, you didn't need Jesus to die. But it's a legal declaration that the payment Jesus made gets applied to your account. That's what justification is. Verse 12, and therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. <laughs> Jesus has it all made, right? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and now it's okay, but he went through that turmoil there. Why? Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He had not sinned, but he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many. He bore the sin of many. He took the sin that other people had, and he put it on himself. That is penal substitution, and made intercession for the transgressors. He goes to God in our place. So it's very clear when you get to Isaiah 53 that this is about penal substitution. But I want to just go really quickly to the New Testament. One more passage now because it's so clear. First Peter 2, 21. Uh, Peter brings in um, Isaiah 53. When we read this, you'll be able to see the connection be all the way back to Isaiah 53. It says, for to this you were called. The idea is submission. He's talking about submission here, how you need to be submitting to people. For to this, for to submission you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us. He did something for us like we should do for other people, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. You see the blatant reference to Isaiah 53 there. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So he's quoting from Isaiah 53 saying, this is what Jesus did. Jesus went like a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus went like, uh, he, 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 well, you were like sheep going astray, but he went to get you because he made that ultimate sacrifice for you by bearing your sins in his body, on the tree, on the cross. So this is penal substitution. Let me break it down into three steps. First, penal substitution, as shown in Isaiah 53 and in 1 Peter 2, Jesus took our punishment. He bore our sins. That's what it says here in 1 Peter. He bore our sins. Well, how could just a few hours of his suffering on the cross bear, for all, the, bear all the sins of all humanity? It's because Jesus has infinite value that living as God and being perfect, never sinning, he didn't have to pay for any of his own. And God the Father sees the infinite value of Jesus, and he says, your time of suffering and death, that is enough. So number one, Jesus took, uh, Jesus took our punishment. Number two, he took our place. It says, in his own body. It should have been our body on the cross, but instead it was Jesus' body on the cross. In the Old Testament, they would offer sacrifices, and often they would put their hands, like they have Yom Kippur, they put their hands on the sacrifice, and they would kill it. And the idea is it was a symbolic transferring of the sins of the people onto that animal, and so that the animal would bear the sins of people. Now, we can't literally go and put our hands on Jesus on the cross, but when we trust in him, that is basically what's happening, our sins being applied to him. He made the payment for every sin. The only thing is you have to receive it. You have to believe it. The third uh, aspect of this is he took us back to the Father. So he took our punishment, he took our place, he brings us back to the Father. First Peter 2.25 there, For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the bishop and shepherd of your souls. So you were like sheep going astray. You were running away, but now you come back to God. Why? Because the ultimate payment has been made. That is penal substitution that Jesus made on the cross for you. So next video, I plan to continue on looking at some rebuttals about penal substitution. I hope you will join me then and hope you enjoy Isaiah 53. God bless.